Hey class, hope you're doing well. We're going to jump into chapter nine, which is client consultation. So hopefully you're doing well and we'll get rolling. So again, this is chapter nine, client consultation. So this is meeting your client or potential client for the first time. Uh, when I was in the corporate gym, so like a 24 hour fitness, Sometimes the service members, so the people that help get people enrolled in the gym, they would schedule these appointments. Sometimes you have to kind of get them yourself. Uh, even when I was just a, a person working out on the floor, I'd have people kind of approach me and like ask questions and um, that kind of led to consultation. So they can happen a variety of ways, again, depending on if you're in the corporate gym or if you run your own business. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to do how to generate clientele. That is a business aspect. Um, but again, this is just kind of, again, from the NSCA's perspective, what um, is recommended or what is necessary to do. So what's the purpose of the consultation? Uh, optimizing the safety during exercise, right? The point is, is that you are there to assist the potential client or the client with their exercising. So safety, livelihood, those types of things. Uh, to screen clients for risk factors and symptoms, right? Sometimes people don't know the risk factors that they have, um, but with the knowledge you will have, you can determine, and we'll look at those risk factors in a little bit, um, if they have them or not, or how many risk factors they have, according to whether it's the ACSM, the NSCA, um, or whoever you you kind of deem those factors off of, um, and then symptoms, whether that's previous injuries, medical history, things like that. Um, we matter. This I know it's not spelled correctly, but this is how it works in the book. Um, so, what are personal trainers? They motivate performance, right? It's an accountability aspect, right? There's a huge component of that. We talked about that early on, like us changing DNA. Like we're manipulating the client's DNA. Like that's pretty powerful. Um, assessing health status. So where are they? Is it just beyond strength um, or a weight on a scale, right? Where is their heart health like? What is their cardiovascular health? Um, things like that. Again, train clients safely. Make sure they're doing something safe in the gym. We can all probably think about people that have done exercises carelessly or incorrectly or in a dangerous manner that could hurt them or they have been hurt. To educate our clients. I think that's one of the most beautiful things because we may not have clients for forever. Right? We might have them for one session. We might have them for three weeks. We might have them for three months or three years. Um, but at some point, we typically lose them. And what are they going to do without us? Now, some of us might say from a business model, we want people to stay with us for forever so that, they, that we, you know, we're able to make an income and things like that. Just know, from my, my opinion, I want someone to have a lifelong ability to train on their own. Basically, what I, what I used to tell my clients, and maybe this is a poor model and why I don't do personal training anymore specifically or, or for myself, is I told clients, I don't want to have you forever, right? I don't want you to be dependent on me forever. I want you to learn from me. I, I want to build that relationship with you, that trust with you. But then I want you to be able to move on your own and create your own workouts, right? Develop your own adaptations and your own um, programming that's going to benefit you and things that you can stick to. So you don't always need me. Now, again, that's my performance. You can stay with people. I know people that have had clients for decades. And so just know that's kind of my mindset going into it, but you educate them, right? They ask why have a response, right? We talked about that. And we're going to talk about that with programming is have a why for why you're putting something in beyond. I saw it and it looks cool, right? How does it align with the person, the, the client's goals, the personal intimate goals that they have? And then if we need to refer clients when necessary, right? You may not be a good fit for every single client, right? You're going to find where you fit in well. Um, even back at the at 24 Hour Fitness, there were individual trainers that worked great with the older population. And the older population told all their other friends who were in the older population, right? And then they would go to that personal trainer. You had some that were doing uh, athletic performance, um, even in a, in a corporate gym setting. You had people, oh, you have diabetes, like go to so-and-so right? Oh, you want a high intensity 30 minute workout, go to so and so. And so you're going to find your niche that where you do really well with. And so sometimes we need to refer because as we refer, people are going to get referred to us because we're going to have our own, again, area or a niche of clientele to work with. How does this get delivered? Um, it's kind of predicted on four factors. So the credentials of the PT. Now credentials aren't everything just because you have a certificate from a weekend certification doesn't mean you're an expert in that right? You learned a lot of information. You may have passed a test, but there's more to it than that. So credentials are important, you know, bachelor's degree, certifications, those types of things, just to get your foot in the door, but you have to keep learning. And I'm going to encourage you to do that. Um, the site of delivery, where are we doing it? Are we doing it at a table? Are we doing it on the gym floor? Are we getting it at a coffee shop or, you know, wherever? Uh, specific population served. Again, who am I working with? Young, old, couples, um, females, males, 
senior citizens, things like that. And then the legal statutes, just what legally am I re required to um, recommend out? What am I required to report? Um, and that can be based off of your gym's corporate lo uh, laws um, or, or state laws or things like that. The steps of the consultation, right? So you need to schedule it uh, and then you need to conduct it, right? So you, you make sure that, you know, hey, Bob, we're going to meet tomorrow at 9 a.m. You know, I'll meet you at the front of the gym, right? Or at the front desk. Uh, then you conduct the uh, then you conduct the, uh, not interview, um, but you go through the assessment process and then you complete the forms and we'll look at those forms in a second. We, based off those forms, we'll evaluate the risk factors. Um, we'll interpret those results, refer out if we need to, and then you obtain medical clearance. Sorry for the typo there. Um, medical clearance if you needed to refer out. So we'll look at you know doctor's notes and things like that. So again, the client consultation you're going to assess if you and the client are compatible, right? What do you offer? If you only offer powerlifting, so bench squat clean, um, heavyweight barbell stuff, and they don't want that, you may not be a good fit for them, right? If that's all you do, right? Or if you only want to work with old people, or you only want to work with females, or I know some that worked really well with like pregnant women or moms or, you know, things like that. So what services do you offer, Right. Uh, evaluate their exercise readiness. So let's just, so now you're, you're like, okay, we'll probably be a match. Um, how ready are they for exercise, right? We kind of talked about that in the last chapter about the motivational status. Um, one motivation, but two, what are they capable of? If they're not able to perform a body weight squat through full range of motion, then I know that I can't program a body weight squat or a weighted squat through full range of motion. There are other things I need to do to improve the mobility of the individual in order to accomplish those goals. Or if they have shoulder pain or they had shoulder surgery, right? Building up and assessing those things and then assess that suitability. Are we going to be able to work together, right? After all of that, are we going to be a good fit or do I need to refer you out to somebody else? Again, then smart goal setting. We talked about that specific, measurable, attainable, uh, realistic, and then time bound, right? So you're like, okay, what type of goals do you want to meet? This is, gets to that why. Um, and when you talk to people, you get, you get to that real deep why, you know, Cindy wants to lose 25 pounds. It's like, great. Why? Well, I want to look better. Okay, that's a great reason, but I, I'm pretty sure there's a deeper why to that, right? Why do you want to lose 25 pounds? Why do you want to look better? And you'll get, and what's beautiful with these conversations is you'll get to those moments of like, I want to be able to feel, I want to fit into a dress that I haven't worn in 15 years. It's like, that's powerful. Like that's nostalgic. That's powerful. That's, you know, they felt sexy in that. They felt attractive in that. Um, and they want to get back into that right? Maybe they want to try to find a potential partner, right? And they want to feel attractive in that sense. So it goes beyond just the weight, right? So you find the weight, but if you, if you feel comfortable doing this, digging into that a little bit deeper, the true motivation, the thing that if you pull it out of them, man, that'll keep them coming back for more, right? They get frustrated with a workout or they skip a workout or two. And it's like, Hey, do you remember when you wanted to uh, fit into that dress before summer? Like, has that changed, right? And it just gets them continually thinking and working and um, really motivated, hopefully, um, but it takes you asking those questions to get there. So it goes from smart into that detail. Um, and then once that's all done and they say, you know what, I wanna do it, right? Then you establish the client trainer agreement. Now, again, if you run your own business or you kind of, you, you work in a gym, they're gonna have their own rules. I remember at 24 Hour Fitness, it was like, we had different options. So it was like, all right, we'll do a one week, three session plan. Then you have the, uh, like a five session plan, a 10 session plan, and then you could do like monthly plans. And then you just kind of figure out where they're at and what they can, you know, financially contribute. Um, obviously, you know, it was pushed to get the bigger numbers, the more consistent numbers. Um, but you just kind of work with the client and figure out what they're able to do. Preparation screening. Um, so this is kind of the cover your butt mentality. So you need to be able to uh, screen the individuals. Assess is probably another word that you hear a lot. Um, and these are very, very important to conduct and they have document documentation of um, just in case things go um, awry and you need to know you have information that you screened them properly and you know everyone signed off and all those good things um, so the part q form we'll look at that in a second and then there's some other additional screening so lifestyle inventories um, you know what type of lifestyle do they have do they smoke do they drink how often do they move um, you know what's their job like things like that uh, informed consent this is them basically saying yes exercise could be risky um, but I'm willing to, I'm not, I'm, I understand the risk and I'm willing to participate in assumption of risk. 
And then child participation, if it, you're working, let's say with younger individuals, so under 18, maybe youth athletes, things like that, you need to have documentation and then things that parents are gonna have to sign. Um, and then establish a record keeping strategy, whatever yours is, if it's scanning all those documents and then them all being PDFs, you keep the old school filing cabinet system, something, you know, documents on your phone, whatever it is, um, figure out your strategy so that's easy to grab them when needed. So here's an example of a Park U form. Um, so again, a questionnaire for people aged 15 to 69. And again, you just kind of look, I'm looking at this yes, no column kind of right up here. So again, has your doctor ever said that you have a heart condition and that you should only do physical activity recommended? Yes or no. Do you feel pain in your chest when you exercise? Yes or no. And you're just kind of going through these. And again, it says if you answered yes to one or more questions, right, it tells you to talk to your doctor before you start becoming physically active. So it's, again, it's covering your butt um, in those things. If it's no to all those questions, right, and you answered honestly, then you can start becoming more physically active. So again, it's, it's, it's not you just throwing someone in who may not be physically prepared um, for that activity. You've gone through the proper channels, okay? And then they sign it. Um, or the parent signs it if it's a child. Let me move this out of the way. So here's a health medical questionnaire. Um, so again, name, date, past or history, again, medical history. So just past or present history. Have you ever had these? Do you have these? Do you have a family history of these things? Again, more things just to be aware of kind of as you go. Um, kind of how do you consider your present attitude toward exercise, right? I can't stand it. I'm motivated. I'm ready to go again. We talked about this in chapter eight, just that level of motivation. Where are they at? Um, right. Present attitude toward goal achievement, just achieving goals in general. So we're getting really philosophical here. It's more than just writing workouts and making someone sweat. Right. You're really making people think and change, potentially change a lifestyle and create new habits. Uh, how important to you are the concepts of health and well-being? Right. Do they care about their health? Right. And if they don't, are you going to be a good fit or if they're really ready for it? Right. Maybe they had a heart attack or they've had a stroke or someone in their family passed away from a, a health issue. Right. And that's motivating them to get in. It's like that's important to understand, again, the why behind why they're there. So evaluate some of these health risks. Right. So what these are going to be called. So these are considered positive. Now, don't get confused. Positive in this case is that counts as a risk factor. So a negative or, or a, a, a poor result versus a negative risk factor, think of it kind of like an oxymoron, is that if you have that, um, then that's okay. So obesity, you don't want it to be greater than 30, right? Hypertension, you don't want a high blood pressure. We talked about that. Um, dyslipidemia, so a high, a high LDL cholesterol. And then prediabetes would be when your plasma glucose is above 100. Now you're not conducting most of these tests. Um, you can calculate BMI. Um, you could do if you've done it before with like uh, checking your heart rate or your blood pressure with a uh, cuff, but you know, like what the doctors do at a doctor's office, um, prediabetes, that would be like through a blood test, which again, if you go through a doctor, they can, they can get a test scheduled for you and get the results. Um, and then this one at the bottom, I do apologize again for the typo. It's a high HDL, right? So if you have a high HDL or a low LDL, okay that is what's considered a good, so that would, that would negate. So let's just say I had, let's say I had a high, I had obesity, high blood pressure, and I was pre-diabetic. So I had three risk factors, but then for whatever reason, my HDL was really, was, was high. HDL is the good cholesterol. Um, then I would go down to two risk factors. Okay. So just kind of think about it that way. A couple other ones, uh, age. So males that are over 45, Okay, that is just, you're just counted as a risk factor. Women at 55. If you have a family history of heart issues, um, death before 55 with the dad. So if someone had a heart attack or stroke um, connected to your heart, heart issue um, at those ages, that would count. Uh, if you smoke, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, what does that mean? That's less than 30 minutes of moderate activity, three days a week for three months. So if basically chronically, you don't move very much right? Or the client doesn't, excuse me, right? So you can figure these things out. Sometimes you might have to ask a few questions or the forms might have it, right? And you can generate your own forms as well, whatever you want to use. Here's from your book. So again, this is in chapter nine. So again, it's the same information, age, family history, cigarette smoking, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and then prediabetes. And then again, a negative would be a high HDL. Um, that's that high density lipoprotein. Um, right there. And they have specific numbers for that. So again, it's quantifiable. Um, 
data to look at, especially if you they have a doctor's note or doctor's information, blood test results, then you can kind of determine these things. Medical conditions. So again, things to be aware of, right? If they have these things, coronary artery and pulmonary disease, right? Do they get pain in, chest, in their chest, neck, jaw, arms, or other areas, right? Typical things, things like heart attacks. Um, shortness of breath, do they get dizzy? Um, ankle edema, do their ankles swell, right? If they're moving or they're up too long. Tachycardia, does their heart rate go out of rhythm? Um, heart murmurs, unusual fatigue, right? When you shouldn't expect it. Um, chest pain, discomfort, unexplained dizziness, fainting, shortness of breath. Again, all of these things are things to be aware of before you just throw a client into a workout, right? You wanna be able to, to, to protect yourself. And if you just took someone on the street or someone in the gym and just said, hey, let's go work out. And you did a high intensity workout, you might be putting them at risk because you don't know anything about them. Get to know your clients or potential clients first. Diabetes is another one, right? Type one, typically you're born with. Type two, um, most of us uh, develop, uh, I would argue through our diet. Um, but again, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, and then orthopedic conditions, right? Do they have rheumatoid arthritis? Did they just have surgery? Um, do they have degenerative bone disease? Those are just a couple. Sarcopenia, that's the loss of muscle tissue. Um, things like that. Again, things to be aware of as best you can. And sometimes these aren't for us to diagnose. Um, that's why we refer out to doctors and medical professionals. Here's that lifestyle evaluation, right? Dietary intake. What are you eating? What, do you, what did you eat today? What have you eaten in the last 24 hours? What does a three-day meal plan look like, right? What have you eaten over the last three days? How often do you eat fast food? Um, where do you go to eat fast food? Okay, those types of things. Exercise and activity. How often do you exercise? What type of exercise? Um, how long do you exercise for? Do you have weights at home? Things like that. Again, figuring it out. And then stress management. This one might be the most avoided or um, looked over, I should say, where just stress in your life. And we've talked about that where it's just, we want to reduce total body stress. If you have chronic stress, that's continual stress, that's work and all those sorts of things, your body's going to respond in that way. So how do we affect that? Now, again, exercise is a huge benefit to stress relief. But let's look at stress as a whole. And then you really become an avenue for those things. You're going to be developing relationships with these clients, right? They're going to tell you about their family life, their work life. Um, and you get to speak into their lives and speak truth into their lives and help reduce that stress so that they can acutely stress themselves with exercise, create the adaptations, and then gain the benefits of it. So again, you as a personal trainer, as a coach, or whatever you want to call yourself, you have a lot of impact on people's lives potentially. So how do we interpret all of these results, right? So you have your part Q, right? This is a great way to determine readiness of the potential client, right? If they answered yes to one or more of these questions, they should go talk to their doctor, right? We looked at that one with the green forms on it. Um, your initial, initial risk stratification, this is one through the ACSM. So it's a little different than the NSCA. Um, you are considered low risk if you have less than or equal to one risk factor. Okay. You are moderate if you have greater than or equal to two risk factors. So again, we talked about like my imaginary self had three, right? It's high if you have known cardiac vascular or pulmonary disease, asthma, et cetera, one or more of the signs and symptoms from coronary artery, artery and pulmonary disease list. So if you have four risk factors, but you don't have any of these, these diseases, you can still be moderate, right? Um, it, but once you have these, we basically move you right into the high category, or excuse me, high in the high category, right? So if you, you might only, maybe you only smoke and everything else is fine, fine by numbers, but you have, you know, cardiac disease. It's like, okay, you're in the high risk factor. We need to be aware of that. You need to go talk to your doctor before you start exercising, right? Again, here you go, low risk, moderate risk, and then high risk. So again, asymptomatic for both of these, but different number of risk factors, right? And then if you have the symptoms, if you reveal the symptoms, then that would put you into that high risk. Again, just another way to look at it, low risk on the left, moderate risk in the middle, high risk on the right. And then it's just telling you again, medical exams, or do you need supervision during exercise? Again, not necessary at low risk, recommended, right? For the moderate risk and then recommended for the high risk. Now it says recommended here, but at 24 hour fitness, so for some things, especially high risk, we required you go to a doctor and get a form signed. And then we would get a copy of the form. And then that would basically, again, cover us in case something happened. And again, here's your definitions of moderate and vigorous exercise. Obtaining medical clearance. 
right? So unsupervised, this is you're presumed healthy with no apparent risk. This is probably most of us, or we assume we are, right? Where you don't need anybody, any medical professionals around you. Uh, supervised, this could be a PT depending on your training and preparation. Um, maybe there are limitations of or pre existing conditions that would restrict, but not limit. So, right, maybe you can't do box jumps because you just had knee surgery, right? So, you can you restrict it, but it doesn't mean that you, you can't exercise, right? You can still do other things. And then you have medically supervised, this would be you present at a higher potential risk due to predisposed conditions, multiple risk factors, you have an uncontrolled disease, right? If you have if you've had heart attacks and you're a type two diabetic and you know you have chronic low back pain or you know you're a smoker right? You might need to be medically supervised, right? Just to, and, but again, each place is going to be different, each location. So here's an example. Uh, Martha G is a 56 year old secretary. Her father died of a myocardial infarction. So a heart attack uh, at the age of 45. Martha reports that her LDL cholesterol has been recorded at 125 milligrams per deciliter. Her BMI is 25. She reports that she has an active lifestyle that includes golf, tennis, and a daily walking routine. So what level of stratification do we give her? Okay, it's gonna be moderate. So we look at two positive risk factors. Again, that means that they're high risk or they potentially risky. So the age, so her age, she's over 55, right? For women, 45 for males. And then her father died at 45. So again, less than 55. So that is a family history of heart issues. And honestly, we can actually probably add more to this. Um, or actually, no, we're actually okay there because her BMI is not 30 yet and then her LDL is in a good range. So it's not necessary for her to have a diagnostic medical examination. Um, but again, it could be recommended for vigorous exercise. And if you're going to do some type of ma uh, maximal test, right? Because she doesn't show any of the symptoms. She has an active lifestyle, but she does have two potential risk factors. Okay. And that's client consultation. And so you'll be doing that with, with clients. Once you figure out your system, right? Once you have um, your sheets, your forms, it becomes really easy. It's just figuring out what you need to ask um, and kind of how to develop it and your sequence of events and things like that. So hopefully that was helpful and I'll see you guys soon.